Well, good evening, everyone. This is Olivia Hereford with the Bay ICT Partnership. Uh, really pleased this after this evening to uh, welcome Doc McConnell, who is the security policy uh, analyst for the Office of Management and Budget. And he's gonna be talking about, his topic today is the messy contradictions of federal cyber policy. This should be pretty interesting today, given all the news. Um, so before I uh, turn it over to uh, Doc, uh, I'd just like to also just give you just a heads up on our, uh, our next talk, which will be in January. And we hope then to have uh, Matt Shelton join us, who's the Director of Technical Risk and Intelligence at FireEye. I'm sure he'll have plenty to talk about too, hopefully if he's able to join us, but we do have him scheduled for uh, January 19th. So now I'd like to uh, turn it over to Doc. I wanna let you know that Doc's gonna go just show, you know, share a few you know, slides and talk to you a little bit about uh, what he does and some of the policies that he's referring to. And then we're gonna open it up to Q&A, okay? So let me stop sharing, Doc, and I'll allow you to take over. Wonderful, thanks, Olivia. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am coming to you from 9 p.m., the Eastern time zone. Um, so uh, for, forgive me, it's been a long couple of days in the federal government. Um, I'm gonna do my best to stay focused, uh, but, but my brain is in a couple of different places this evening. Um, so as Olivia said, and thank you for the introduction, my name is Doc McConnell. I'm a cybersecurity policy analyst with the Office of Management and Budget within the Executive Office of the President. Um, I work on a variety of cybersecurity and IT policy issues that I'll get into in a few minutes. And I do have a couple of slides to kick off our discussion. But even before we get into that, um, I wanted to ask, I'm going to flip the script a little bit and ask if a couple of you can come off mute and give me a sense. I've, I've got two questions for you, and I'll ask for just a couple of you to volunteer and answer these questions. The first is um, kind of where are you in your cybersecurity career? Um, are, are, are you just a student? Are you a practitioner looking to build your skills? So kind of give me a sense of where some of you are and what your backgrounds are. That's question one. And then question two, are there any specific areas you wanna make sure we spend time on tonight so I can make sure that we leave time for that in the conversation? So question one, where are you in your cybersecurity career? Question two, are there specific areas you wanna make sure we focus on tonight? I just offer it up to whoever wants to, to come off mute and answer. So hi, I'm with uh, Matt Tron. So this is my Iman Vyas. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. So basically, I have been working as a security monitoring analyst from past two years now. And that's my experience regarding cybersecurity. And I've done my CEH certification masters and uh, various few other certification as well. So that's what, uh, that's the answer for your first question. And second question is like, the, how is it uh, regarding working with the uh, government and sort of stuff? So would you guide me with the same? Yeah. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Let me see if I can get one more person just to make sure we're kind of scoping this appropriately. Um, and you don't have to answer both questions if you don't have an answer to if you don't have an answer to both, either question is fine. If you want to throw it into the chat, that's fine with me too. Any other specific questions you want us to talk about this evening? Okay, uh, that's fine. We're I'm I'm happy to kind of get started with uh, what I have prepared. Um, what I will say is, you all were su supposed to have uh, two people speaking to you this evening. I was going to be splitting my talk with a colleague named Anna, who works uh, for the FBI, and she unfortunately wasn't able to make it this evening. Um, so I do not have an hour's worth of content prepared. Um, so you're going to have to generate some questions at some point. But that I'm I'm, I'm happy to kick off the conversation. So let me share my screen and I have just a couple slides for you. Um, let's see, here we go. So 
Olivia mentioned that I'm going to be talking about the messy contradictions of federal cybersecurity policy. And the purpose of these slides is not so much to get into the dirty details of how everything works everywhere in the government, but I did think it would be valuable to talk about how federal cybersecurity is structured, because I think people have very different visions for what federal cybersecurity is and what that means and how it works. So just as a scoping conversation, let me give you a sense of some of the authorities, some of the key players in this, where I and the rest of OMB fit into the equation, and then we can go from there with whatever questions uh, come up. So a lot of text on this slide, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and kind of summarize it for you at a high level. The first thing you should realize is that federal cybersecurity authorities do not exist in one place. The federal government has been relying on technology and computers for a very long time, and Congress has not gone through and methodically updated the IT chapter of law year after year as technology has improved. There are about 17 different places in US code that govern the management of information technology and cybersecurity in the federal government. And that is the starting point. The absolute foundation that I want you to take away from this conversation is federal cybersecurity is an absolute mess. There are vast sets of, of legislative text and statutory text that govern cybersecurity. And much of what we do in the federal government, in addition to actually protecting the machines, protecting the data, is about trying to untangle that and figure out who's in charge in a given situation. So the first thing that's really important for you to understand about federal cybersecurity is the Federal Information Security Modernization Act, or FISMA. The most recent version of FISMA was passed in 2014, and effectively it lays out three categories of responsibilities. First, OMB, that's me, will create and issue federal cybersecurity policy. Second, DHS will oversee the implementation of that policy. And within DHS, it is specifically the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. You'll hear me refer to OMB and CISA a lot in this conversation. The final set of responsibilities that FISMA creates is for NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, to develop guidelines and standards. And so NIST is within the federal government, um, the author of much of our technical documentation. They're the one who issue the 400 page guides for all of the security controls that need to be implemented if you wanna be up to federal standards. A um, lot of private sector uses NIST as a guideline. Much of the federal government is actually required to meet the standards that they issue. But you can kind of think of these three bodies as working in tandem. OMB issues high level policy, we set direction, we say this is the direction we're going with respect to identity management, with respect to high value assets, with respect to reporting on incidents. DHS is the one that actually has the massive staff that follows up with agencies and provides technical support to ensure that they can do the things that OMB tells them they have to do. And NIST is the one that sets the broad guidelines within which everyone operates. They say protecting a system or managing identity means you have to meet these technical standards. So FISMA is number one. The second one that I want to mention to you is the Cybersecurity Enhancement Act. And the Cybersecurity Enhancement Act focuses mostly on DHS and CISA. It sets out some very, very basic requirements that agencies have to follow with respect to managing their sensitive data, with respect to encryption, with respect to identity management. Um, there's some requirements in there about what agencies are, are required to do with respect to intrusion detection and reporting when they are able to detect intrusions. But the Cybersecurity Enhancement Act, which is more recent than FISMA, kind of complicates this question. If FISMA says, OMB is responsible for A and DHS is responsible for B and NIST is responsible for C, but the Cybersecurity Enhancement Act is focused entirely on CISA and what CISA is supposed to do for the entire federal government. That makes it actually a very messy question for where that leaves OMB and where that leaves individual agencies as they're required to respond to these, these cybersecurity controls and these cybersecurity requirements that Congress sets. And um, just Given recent events, I thought it might be useful to mention that in addition to the laws that Congress passes, the federal government, as we move from administration to administration, is also very fond of issuing executive actions to constrain our behaviors and say, 
yeah, 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 Congress has all of these rules, but we're going to add a bunch of rules on top of that. Um, notably, in the Obama administration, Presidential Policy Directive, or PPD 41, established a new structure for United States cyber incident coordination. Um, this policy did a couple of things, or policy directive did a couple of things. It defined what a significant cyber incident is in terms of national security impact, economic impact, impact to um, you know, civil liberties, civil rights of, uh, of US citizens and US residents. And it created the concept of a cyber unified coordination group, which is something we'll talk about in a few minutes, but it's established by the, the National Security Council. Um, okay, so that was like legal statutory executive policy framework. A couple things that aren't mentioned here are the various executive orders that presidents sign. What's not mentioned here are the individual policies that OMB puts out that are a little, that are much more focused than these broad based requirements. Before I move on to the next slide, are there any questions about what I've touched on so far? Let me pull up the chat here. I see that people are throwing things in the chat. No new okay. ones. There are, there are a couple of ones that have been there before, but I don't see any any new ones. Okay, all right. I'm just, sorry, I'm just seeing Alan Z here about talking about getting into management. And yes, I'm gonna talk about kind of different career tracks and different um, jobs within the federal government in just a couple of slides. So hold that thought um, and then ping me if I don't actually answer your question. Uh, so uh, basically how do you, uh, means there's a CDI say trend close and there are FISMA trend close. So there would be a point some laws would overlap each other. So how would you differentiate them and how would you basically synthesize them and uh, make them work properly sort of thing? Um, great question. Um, let's talk about the key players here, because as new laws, new regulations, new policies come out, um, there's there can often be a bit of a scrum as the agencies get together and they figure out who's going to be responsible for what. So um, the Office of Management and Budget, where I work, is a component of the White House. It is technically within the executive office of the president and the EOP um, covers several different agencies, but kind of the most relevant ones for the discussion that we're having today are the Office of Management and Budget and the National Security Council. Also, you already heard me talk about CISA a little bit. Um, a couple of other key players, although not the only key players in the cybersecurity space are the Department of Defense and the Director of National Intelligence. So let's take a second to talk about the um, the jurisdiction that each of these organizations has across the federal government and over federal cybersecurity policy. So OMB, um, most people know about OMB because we create the president's budget every year, which means we are putting together all of the money that HHS needs to run their programs and DOD needs to run their programs and all of the other agencies as they kind of line up their priorities. They come to OMB and they say, we need a billion dollars this year. And OMB comes back and says, no, actually you only need $800 million to do your work. But within that top line number where we're creating the president's budget, there's a ton of work that happens with an OMB to figure out what are the priorities as established by the president as established by the cabinet secretaries, as established by the administration broadly, and how do we figure out how to accomplish those priorities over the upcoming year? So OMB is literally divided into a management side and a budget side. That budget side creates all of the budget numbers with the information that comes from the management side about the various policy initiatives that, that the president and the administration are trying to accomplish. Um, that management side is where I sit, and within the management side, I sit specifically in the IT and cybersecurity office. My office is the office of the Federal Chief Information Officer. The Federal Chief Information Security Officer also sits there. And so we are kind of the, the, the bright minds or not so bright minds behind federal cybersecurity policy. So our job is to set those goals and, and to manage the agencies as they are trying to go out and execute on the money that they're given every year to accomplish the cybersecurity policies that are being set by the White House. Within the White House and an important body in setting those priorities is the National Security Council. So the National Security Council has, is kind of famous for being um, geography specific, right? There are some kind of 
well-known stories about the you know, Russia analyst uh, or the China analyst on the National Security Council or Middle Eastern specialists on the National Security Council. But in recent years, the NSC has also focused on some cross-cutting priorities. And one of those priorities is establishing a cyber directorate. That cyber directorate is responsible for setting things like the national security strategy for cybersecurity. Um, OMB and NSC work very closely together. We sit in, oftentimes when we're crafting new policy documents, we sit in weekly meetings together. And so I would say that you can think about us as two arms on a single policy making body, but generally issuing those broad based statements. Things like we want to establish international norms in cybersecurity. We want to build the cybersecurity workforce and invest in educational programs that produce cybersecurity professionals. We want to ensure that um, there is additional coordination at the national level in cases of significant cyber incidents, much like the one that FireEye reported recently that is now affecting commerce and treasury and a bunch of other agencies within the government. So kind of think about us as the, the broad policymaking apparatus. Beneath that, the reason I've carved out DHS, DOD, and DNI are to talk about kind of the three sectors within the federal government. CISA is responsible, broadly speaking, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, for civilian agencies. Um, everyone who's not military or intelligence, CISA has oversight over their, their cybersecurity, and they have various authorities to issue policy directives or to come in and kind of take a look at what agencies are doing or to respond when agencies have an incident that they report back up. DOD handles military um, and civilian uh, systems, but the civilian systems that they handle are specific to the warfighting effort. And then the DNI handles the classified systems. Basically anything that holds classified sensitive compartmented information is going to be under the jurisdiction of the DNI. Collectively, the Director of National Intelligence, the Secretary of Homeland Security, and the Secretary of Defense have the authority to um, set rules and establish policies for the entirety of the federal government. So whenever the White House is considering issuing a policy, we have to be very careful about the scope of the policy we're issuing. What are we trying to do with respect to civilian agencies, with respect to military systems, and with respect to classified information systems? And we are, I think that you can think about those three as having different needs, obviously, because they have different threat models and they are kind of they, they have they have different fundamental missions and they have different threat models. So from an offensive and a defensive perspective, we have to think about our policies as, as affecting all of those sectors differently. So um, to the question that was asked about how do we handle new policy directives, new laws that come in, one of the thing, uh, one of the things that Congress likes to do is they'll pass a law saying we need to protect Internet of Things, right? Congress passed a law earlier this month that said the federal government is required to establish cybersecurity controls for Internet of Things devices. I don't know what that means, right? Congress was just passing a law because they think that it sounds good. But their law says OMB is going to issue policy that says exactly how we're going to do this. And so you'll see this kind of trickle down effect in federal cybersecurity where somebody comes up with a bright idea. Maybe the National Security Council says something nonsensical like we should have international standards for cybersecurity. Or maybe Congress says something nonsensical like webcam should have cybersecurity standards, right? Okay, they're not bad ideas, but they don't really mean anything. And so then whoever it is at this top level who's setting this policy is gonna trickle it down to the next agency or the next body in the cybersecurity policymaking process. And Congress is gonna say, OMB will issue policy within 60 days that is going to establish exactly how we are going to have standards for IoT devices. And then OMB, knowing OMB, is gonna say, we're going to have CISA enforce whatever guidance we write for IoT devices. CISA has to go out and actually evaluate, monitor on a monthly basis. I'm making things up, but, but monitor on a monthly basis um, what IoT devices are in a given agency's environment and how they are securing them. And if there's an incident, CISA is required to report back to OMB. So as you're thinking about the policymaking process, my biggest piece of advice to you 
is to stop thinking about the federal government as one entity and start thinking about it as a bunch of different entities who are constantly in tension with each other. This is also a point that I want to, for you all to remember in just a second when we come back to like, what should you do in the federal government or, or what should you do in a cybersecurity career more broadly? Because it's a lot less unified and cohesive, I think, than a lot of people imagine it to be. Okay. That was a little bit more than just key players, but let me pause there and ask if there are any additional questions on this slide before I move on. All right, great. I'm gonna keep going, but um, happy to take questions as we go. So um, the federal cybersecurity work roles. I mentioned NIST earlier on this slide. NIST is responsible for developing guidelines and standards. Some of the guidelines and standards that NIST has created, uh, they've categorized into what they call the Federal uh, Cybersecurity Workforce Framework. And I actually should have put a link on this slide, but I'll drop it into the chat um, before we're done here. And if you are exploring careers in cybersecurity, if what you want to be is a cybersecurity professional, I would strongly encourage you to go and check out the uh, NICE workforce framework. In fact, I'm going to pull it up real quick because I'm afraid I'm going to forget it if I don't. Um, give me one second and then I'm going to share a different window on my on my screen. They just updated again. recently, didn't they? Yes. So they are in the process of issuing a substantial update. Their workforce framework, I think, initially came out in 2018. I'm not going to swear to that date, but I think I think 2018-ish, let's say. Um, and they have realized that while it is valuable to have a workforce framework, um, many of their work roles were too broad. Some of their work roles were too narrow and across the board, they want to make some changes to the way you evaluate whether somebody is qualified to be in one of those work roles. So um, let's start with what are we talking about with the workforce framework? I'm going to make the assumption that some of you are not familiar with this. And if everybody is, then you can stop me and we'll move on. But the very first thing that they do within this workforce framework is they categorize cybersecurity into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different categories. And NIST is not in the business of saying, we are the ground truth and we know everything. What NIST is in the business of saying is it is useful for us to have a shared framework and a shared language to talk about things. And cybersecurity is a big word that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So let's be more specific about it. And in terms of talking about individual work roles, one of the things that they wanted to do is, is uh, break down cybersecurity into some fundamental functions, analysis, collection, and operation, um, investigation, operate and maintain, oversee and govern, this is my specialty area, protect and defend, and securely provision. So I think just at a top level, just from looking at this, and let me go ahead and put the, the um, link into the chat here, just in case you want to open this up and take a look as we're going through and kind of poke around on your own. I think just from taking a look at this, if you have been thinking about yourself as a cybersecurity professional, you can probably start to gravitate toward some of these categories, or at least gravitate away some of these categories. So, um, for example, FBI cyber forensic investigators are going to fall into this investigate category. So let's open up the investigate specialty area and take a look at some of the information that NIST has put together on this. So you can talk about cyber investigation and digital forensics. And we'll just click into cyber investigation. You'll see that it's got a general description about what the cyber investigation category entails, applying tactics, techniques, and procedures for a full range of investigative tools and processes. And then within cyber investigation, you're going to see a set of work roles. For this one, this is fairly narrowly tailored, and you're really just looking at the cybercrime investigator. And then that cybercrime investigator is further broken down into abilities, knowledge, skills, tasks, and capability indicators. Some of these are more broad than others. You've got knowledge of cyber threats and vulnerabilities. That's pretty broad. You've got ability to find and navigate the dark web using Tor. That's a little bit more narrow. 
So um, as you're thinking about your own cybersecurity careers and what you're interested in, it can be helpful to stop thinking about this as cybersecurity as a career and start thinking about the specific functions that you're interested in pursuing. In an ideal world, you would then be able to look at a bunch of job descriptions, right? You wanna go work for Microsoft. You wanna go work for Google. You wanna come work for the federal government. In an ideal world, you would be able to see a job and have it be tagged back to cyber investigation or securely provision or oversee and govern and understand within this framework what the job, kind of what, how the job that you're, that you're looking at fits in. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we've kind of coalesced as a society around agreeing that this is the exact right set of terms, the exact right set of concepts, but at least it gives you a vocabulary and a framework and the ability to differentiate between different categories within cybersecurity. So I do think it's helpful for you to kind of continue to educate yourself, continue to build your vocabulary. And I think it's useful for you to ask questions to figure out where a given role that you're considering may fit into the broader tapestry of cybersecurity. Um, let me just come back and touch real quick on the question that was asked earlier about um, goal is to become a CISO. Can you talk about how to get into management? So there are different ways to get into management. There are several different tracks. And I think that you probably, and, and, there's, and there's some more traditional tracks, right? One of the somewhat traditional tracks is to kind of work your way up through, I'm gonna be a help desk analyst, to I'm gonna be a network engineer, to I'm gonna be a supervisory network engineer, to I'm going to um, kind of start to move into that management role to um, all of a sudden I'm deputy CISO and the CISO is resigning and I'm gonna take over. But, that is, that is not the only way to get into management. Management, at least in the federal government, is a set of different skill sets that I think you can build both within a directly cybersecurity career and also adjacent to a cybersecurity career. So you're going to have to have some basic technical knowledge in order to be an effective CISO, right? You're going to have to understand um, basic things like how do I discover what's within my area of responsibility? How do I discover what's on my network? How do I figure out what kind of security trolls, security controls are already in place? What are the, the questions that I need to be asking to the rest of my management team to understand what their goals are, what we can compromise on, what we cannot afford to compromise on? What are the fundamental security controls that I need to put in place in order to protect my assets, my network, my environment? Right? You're going to have to have enough technical knowledge to be able to answer these questions, to be able to know what the universe of answers are, and then to be able to say, given options A, B, and C about security controls to put in place, what is the best option? And in fact, how do I um, evaluate those trade-offs? But that's not the only set of, of knowledge and skills that you're going to need to have. You also need to have some basic understanding of the fundamental mission capability of the organization that you're trying to protect and defend. If you're a CISO for the Department of Commerce, let's say, you need to have an understanding of what the Department of Commerce is, what the Department of Commerce's mission is, and enough of an understanding of the individual lines of business within the Department of Commerce, the individual bureaus within the Department of Commerce, that you can sit down and have a conversation with the people who lead those bureaus to understand what their needs and desires are. So in terms of getting into management, I would encourage you to ask yourself two questions as you're kind of deciding what those career steps are. The first question you should ask yourself is in terms of the technical side of the capabilities I'm developing. What do I, what do I know and what are my gaps? And your gaps will be informed by the organization that you're targeting the organization that you're interested in working for. What do you know already and what do you need to know in order to effectively serve that organization? If you need some help answering that question, then maybe what you're looking for is a job, any job within that organization. So one, one question that you need to ask yourself on the technical side, the other question you need to ask yourself is, what are those management skills that I need? Because a CISO is also about making compromises and enabling the business. And 
I'm probably telling you things that other people have already told you because I think we've evolved as an industry in terms of thinking about the CISO role. But if nobody said this to you yet, the CISO's job can't just be to lock everything down and make it secure, right? We've all heard the old adage, the most secure computer is unplugged, turned off in a closet behind a locked door. Great, it's secure, but it doesn't actually do any good, right? The if, if that is the computer that your business or your government agency is relying on, then you're not going to be able to accomplish anything. And so you're, as a CISO, as you're thinking about getting into management, you have to have a deep enough understanding of the business side to understand what is necessary to enable the business, because a business can't operate if you're having intellectual property walking out the door, what's necessary to protect the business, and what is a bridge too far? What are your limits? What can you not do, right? If you're a business in 2020 or 2021, you can't afford to not be on the internet. If you're selling something, you have to have a web-based storefront. So you're a lot more secure if you've got no internet-facing devices, but that's also not a feasible business model for most businesses that are standing up today. So you have to have an under, a, a, a significant enough understanding of your own business to be able to protect them appropriately without interfering with the mission or the business, the, the fundamental business functions. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. If it doesn't, then throw a follow up in the chat or feel free to come off mute and ask me. I'm going to move on to uh, Chaz Dancing Machine here and the breach on solar winds and FireEye. Um, I'm happy to talk a little bit about this breach. Uh, I think that I, if you have been I guess I'll talk a little bit about the breach at a high level. If you have more specific questions about it, though, and I'm, I'm interested in hearing them because I think that there are a lot of different directions you can go when you're talking about a breach of kind of this magnitude. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, and, but if you need me to pull it back up, I'm happy to just because it's a little bit easier for me to kind of see all of your, well, at least your boxes and the chat window when I'm not sharing my screen. Um, so, OK. Let's talk about the breach on solar winds and FireEye. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that I work at OMB, which is a, which is a policy shop. Um, I do not work in an operational component. Um, I am not responsible for kind of firewall management or 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 you know taking a look at network traffic or responding in a technical sense to a breach. My job, my office's job is to establish the policy framework that ensures that there is direction and intent and oversight over agencies, but leaving it to the agencies to figure out in order to achieve the goals that the White House is setting, how do we manage our budget? How do we manage our technical resources? How do we manage our IT in order, in order to actually put those technical controls in place? So when you've got an event like this breach, I'm not the one who's working 24 hours a day trying to figure out if I've got uh, how how I've got solar winds in my environment. That's just that's that's not my job. What I absolutely am doing or will be doing in a, in in over the next few months to a year is figuring out how did we end up in this situation and what are the options available to us to prevent us from getting into this situation again. Again, you've got to have a realistic sense about what is achievable and what's not achievable. It's not achievable to just not use any third party systems, right? In an ideal world, the government would build all of our own systems. We would all be in a closed off network. The only other trusted devices on that network would be government built and government owned. And then we would have a really high level of confidence in our security because we would know it would be incredibly hard for anybody to inject anything into that environment without us knowing about it. But that's not possible, right? We are not every IT company and every software company on the planet, and we can't build everything we need in-house at any kind of a reasonable cost level. So we've got to engage with the outside world. We've got to partner with private industry, and we have to rely on the services and the products that are created by that industry in order to manage our own services so that we can provide the digital services that you as a consumer, you as a US citizen or a US resident are interested in receiving from us. 
Within that framework, we have to figure out what are the policy levers we can pull on to make sure that agencies are sufficiently protected without preventing them from actually doing the business of government, doing the partnering, the contracting, in order to, to deliver those services um, that, that the, the consumers, the customers rely on. Um, we also have a coordination role though. What I'm talking about in terms of policy making is long-term and it's figuring out strategic direction for the federal government. The more immediate role that we have to play is one of coordination and organization. There is an absolutely massive amount of information right now that is unknown. And we, we don't know, we have at least, we, you know, publicly, there is a lack of information about exactly who was affected by this breach. It's also unknown, at least publicly, exactly what information was compromised in this breach. Was this something where information was being stolen? Was it something where information was being changed within our systems? Or was, it, um, was there some nefarious purpose that we haven't yet seen that may happen at some point in the future, right? You can, you can imagine kind of a, a ticking time bomb scenario in which certain things were scattered around our systems and we actually haven't yet seen the full impact, even if we know that there was an initial compromise. Um, the role that we play, that OMB plays, that the National Security Council plays, kind of the, the broader White House operation plays in an environment like this, is bringing together the primary affected actors and providing leadership through the crisis to ensure that information is being collected in a standardized, methodical way, that the same questions are being asked to everyone, so that all of the people who are going out and doing their own internal investigations are looking for the same thing, and to ensure that if new information comes up that could change our understanding of what has happened and what our level of exposure is, that, that information gets transmitted to the right people extremely quickly. Um, as you all probably know, timing is very important in something like this. And as much as the federal government has an interest in protecting itself and being um, thoughtful about what information is released out to the public. So, so, so that's kind of one half of the tension, right? If you've got two things pulling against each other in terms of information flow, there are reasons that the federal government may not want to release all of the information right away. There are also reasons why the federal government has to communicate because there are resources available in the federal government, information that's being collected within the federal government that are also relevant to private sector um, customers of SolarWinds and, and the Orion product. And so our job in responding to this is, is as I said, both thinking long-term, preventing this from happening again, um, one thing I didn't mention in my bio is I was also on the OPM team after the big data breach in 2014, 2015. And so I kind of did some of that like next year rebuilding. Um, I'm in a different phase of this breach, um, but I kind of, so I kind of have both perspectives. Like what's the immediate response? What's, what are the coordination steps we need to take? As well as like in the year after the breach, after we've gone through the initial analysis, like what do we need to do to ensure that, we're, that we are well protected and that we can restore trust among the citizens and our ability to manage our systems and manage your data. Um, so I guess that's my initial response. Um, but as, as with my previous question, if there are other questions you wanna ask about, about the breach, um, feel free. And I actually think I saw one pop into the chat here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so will the Biden administration need to focus on the solar winds hack? Yes. Is that sufficient? Yes. Um, this is something that it is. We so, okay, so first of all, we are extremely close to the Biden administration. Um, for folks who um, for folks who haven't worked in the federal government, there are kind of phases, there are, there are uh, cycles in the federal calendar. Um, one of the cycles that we're about to enter is the last two weeks of December in which the federal government positively shuts down. Um, people are trying to take their end of year annual leave before it expires. Um, the federal government, one of the things that's great about a job in the federal government is it's generally pretty flexible. 
um, about taking your leave. And so even people who don't necessarily have leave expiring are looking to go spend some time with their family. Um, I guess the leave situation is a little wonky this year with people not doing as much travel as usual. But suffice to say, there are a ton of people out of the office in the last two weeks of December. So of the roughly four weeks we have left before the Biden administration is inaugurated, um, two of them are essentially gone. Just people aren't going to be around and work won't get done. Then the first two weeks of January, while it's true that people are generally back in the office, a lot of what they're going to be focused on is the transition planning and the briefing up of the agency review teams that are already on site and already talking. And so of the four weeks that are gone, the, of, that are left, two are gone and two people are going to be at best 50% focused on the existing administration and 50% focused on the incoming administration and briefing the people who may be their new bosses. So that means that we are not going to be able to get even, even much, much smaller components of work. We're already in the federal government thinking in terms of how do we get the Biden administration ready to hit the ground running on this. Um, for something that is as big as the solar winds hack, um, this is something that we will probably be dealing with for the next conservatively two years. We have a huge amount of work to do, even after we get through the initial analysis and an understanding of what the impacts of this were. Um, we are going to have to rebuild certain components of agency systems. If there are agencies that were relying on this software that now can't trust this software, they're going to have to rip that out and replace it with something else. And that's going to take time and money, and it's going to have an impact on the mission. Um, they're also probably going to be some supply chain impacts to this. Um, one of the, the policy areas that I work on is focusing on the federal supply chain for information technology. How do we have assurance that when we buy a product, be it a physical product or a piece of software, that we can trace that all the way back to its origins and understand who had control over it at each of those points to ensure that we're not letting a foreign adversary write software that we're then installing on our sensitive federal networks. That analysis is going to be something that we're going to have to do writ large in the long um, in the long run to ensure that we protect ourselves from this kind of a breach in the future. So the Biden administration is going to have to worry about this and probably the administration after that is going to have to worry about it as well. We are still talking about the OPM breach. Again, that happened in 2014 and 2015. We're still talking about that today and the changes that we need to make to federal cybersecurity to protect ourselves from another OPM breach. I think that this changes the conversations in ways we can't predict yet. Um, all right, thoughts on certification, college degree, or both? I think this is a personal decision. I do not think that there is a right answer to this question. Certifications and college degrees do different things. Um, there are both things that you can put on your resume that indicate that you are a uh, professional, that indicate that you have a certain base level of knowledge, but it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish by getting them. So I mentioned in, I don't know if my bio was shared with you, but I mentioned in my bio that I am finishing up this month a uh, Master of Cybersecurity um, at UC Berkeley. And I made a decision to go and get that Master of Cybersecurity instead of a certification. Um, well, I shouldn't say instead of a certification. For the period of time, anyway, that I was doing it, I was choosing to do that instead of a certification, although that doesn't foreclose the opportunity for me to go out and get a certification in the future. So just a couple of my thoughts, and these are not comprehensive, and they, they may not even apply to you. I think that generally speaking, a college degree, uh, something like a master's degree in cybersecurity or a bachelor's degree in cybersecurity, is going to give you a broader approach to the discipline and you're going to learn things that are less directly applicable to your day-to-day -day job skills. There are benefits and drawbacks to that, right? One of the classes that I took in my program was on privacy engineering, and it was a lot of hard math about how to evaluate the exact privacy impacts of making certain changes to your database administration or even to your data collection mechanism up front. Um, that's not directly relevant to my job. I don't work in database management, and I'm not involved in large-scale data collection, and I'm not involved in data release to the public. So that broad base of knowledge is helpful to me because it kind of helps me understand 
from a, a from a broader perspective, the full scope of the programs that we are administering and the impacts of cybersecurity policies that we put out on privacy. But I am probably never going to run any of the equations in my job that I had to run for that class. Certifications, on the other hand, are much more targeted, much more focused to a specific set of skills. And if you're in security administration, a security plus degree is a great way to make sure that you've got the vocabulary, the hands-on technical skills to do your day-to-day -day work and to prove to somebody else, because the security plus uh, certification is well known at this point, to prove to somebody else that you know what you're talking about. It doesn't necessarily give you that broad base. It's not necessarily going to help you kind of get out of, like if you have your heart set on, on this job and this position, Security Plus is probably not going to help you kind of broaden your perspective and see the positions that are over here that might be interesting and the career paths, you know, a couple years down the road over here that might be interesting, but it probably will help you do, do this job better. So it really depends on what you're looking for. Are you looking to expand your horizons, um, kind of look broader, think about, you know, multiple career paths. A college degree may well introduce you to kind of more opportunities to do that and give you more questions. Um, the certifications are generally, generally quicker, cheaper, and more targeted, and may be better if what you're trying to do is get that certification you need to qualify for a position that you know you want to hold. That's not, again, not comprehensive. I'm happy to talk about that more with people individually. Um, but I'd say that's kind of my, my broad based response. Um, okay, I see a bunch of questions flowing in. So I'm going to try and speed this up because I know that we're, uh, Olivia, we're done in 10 minutes, right? Okay, all right. So I'll try, I'll try and rapid fire some of these and then I'll put my contact information in the chat um, to make sure that you all can reach out to me if you have follow ups after this. Okay. What happened to hack government databases since they have access to all our financial records? Also, what do you feel about mass surveillance of our emails and tapping into our phone calls? Um, two very big questions that I'm definitely not going to be able to rapid fire my way through. Um, so I'll give a couple of thoughts about both of them. Um, hacked government databases are, so government databases are a component of the data collection apparatus that has been built up in kind of our, our data economy that we all live in today. It is very important before I go forward to make sure that you all know that I'm speaking to you in my personal capacity tonight and not in my government capacity. While I spend my time working as a cybersecurity analyst for the federal government, that is, I'm not representing OMB and I'm not representing the federal government and I'm not representing the Trump administration. I'm just Doc McConnell tonight. That said, let's talk about our data and uh, the databases that store it. There is a trade-off every single time somebody shares a piece of data with anyone, be it a private company or a government agency. Um, and there are lots and lots of reasons that you may not really have a choice about whether to share that data. You want to buy a PlayStation, you're going to have to share some information with Best Buy. You want to get a student loan, you're going to have to share some information with the Department of Education. Every time a piece of data about you goes into one of those databases, you are more vulnerable than you were before when that data only existed in your head. I do not necessarily think that a hack of a kind of a generic government database, call it the student loan database, call it a housing database that's managed by uh, housing and urban development. I do not think that necessarily the breach of a government database is more harmful to the people whose data was stored there than a breach of a private company database, a target database, for example, that has your credit card information stored. It's going to be more harmful for some people in one case and more harmful for other people in the other. And it's going to depend on how much and how often your data has been compromised in the past. But I think that generally speaking, the federal government has a more, um, my personal philosophy is that the federal government has a greater responsibility to you, somebody living and working in the United States of America to protect your information than a private company does, because oftentimes the data that we collect is compulsory. You are required to provide it to us. The IRS doesn't give you an option about whether to fill out your, your, your taxes every year, right? So I think that generally speaking, 
we have a, a greater obligation to protect it. And um, the fact that your financial records are out there is a mishmash of the data that's been stolen from the federal government and the data that's been stolen from the private companies that you interact with. How do I feel about mass surveillance of emails and tapping into phone calls? Um, I think that there's always gonna be a trade-off in um, a society about security versus privacy. And I think that our society is trending a little to, I think that we have more work to do in protecting the privacy of the people who live here. And I think it's important to think about that both from the perspective of what does the law enforcement apparatus in the federal government do and what powers do they have to access data and what ability, what, um, what are we going to allow and what are we going to prohibit in terms of um, commerce and voluntary transactions. Um, and I put voluntary in quotes because you think about owning a cell phone and the data that can be collected uh, about you from your use of your cell phone that is in many ways not voluntary if you want to really participate in society. That's a woefully inadequate answer. And I think we could do a full hour on privacy versus security, um, but I'll leave it there given the time constraints. Uh, following the supply chain would not have stopped the solar winds attack, would it? Outstanding question. No, it would not. No, it would not. The solar winds attack, based on what we know right now, was not brought off because there was foreign control over an important component of the supply chain. It was brought off because um, what we believe to be true is the Russian government was able to compromise what we thought was a trusted supply chain. I was not necessarily intending to suggest that supply chain control protects us completely from all attacks. I was suggesting that making sure we're managing our supply chain risk is one important factor, one important thing that we um, may want to control as we're considering the, the infinitely broad set of risks that, uh, that we're exposed to every time we turn on a new system, plug in a new box, install a new piece of software. But you're absolutely right. Based on what we know right now, better supply chain knowledge would not have fully protected us against the solar winds attack. <clears throat> All right, can supply chain verify TikTok that access our personal data? Could you give your take on how to protect intellectual patents from Chinese hacks? Um, there's a different, what I'll say about this is there's a difference between knowing where control lies and being able to protect against it. You've seen a lot of noise from Congress and the White House over the last four months, six months about TikTok and what the where is it necessary to, like, what are the controls that we should put in place as a society to protect ourselves from what we perceive to be a threat? Um, I, I don't know that we have come to agreement as a society. The Trump administration has certainly put the word out that TikTok should be banned in the United States, um, but they've also made some interesting choices in terms of not necessarily taking steps that would have limited TikTok as much as it could theoretically be limited in the United States. So again, a trade-off there between protecting ourselves against TikTok versus taking advantage of kind of the ex uh, opportunities it provides for self-expression, the opportunities for free exchange between societies. And in many ways, TikTok is a great way for people across language barriers to communicate. All of those are potential benefits of using TikTok at the potential, well, at the, at the risk of exposing personal data to a foreign government that might be using it for nefarious purposes. Um, okay, really rapid fire now, because I know we're running out of time. You believe a degree is, ne is needed to get started in the field? No, there are lots of um, people who are very successful in this field who don't have degrees, who have practical experience, hands-on experience, and trying to make the federal government in particular more accessible to people who don't have that uh, degree is been a focus of that, that's a an area that I've specifically worked on um, over the past two years. Doc, let's go to seven oh five. Is that okay with you? That's fine with me. Yeah. Okay. That's great. I, I'm thinking about you because it's ten oh five. Yeah. Well, I probably will cut it at ten oh five, but I'll, I'll stay on for the extra five minutes. Thanks, Olivia. Um, master's degree program at Cal. What do they train in terms of hands-on security protocols? So. 
Um, my master's degree did not, in its formal curriculum, go deep into hands-on security protocols. What they did was connect us to um, activities and challenges like um, hack the box or some like internal challenges within uh, Berkeley for kind of getting that hands-on experience um, and kind of different people with different interests were able to either um, pull in a few other students from the program or just use uh, California as a, as a platform to um, launch a couple of those challenges themselves. So in terms of the hands-on security protocols, on the one hand, California kind of didn't push us any, in any particular direction. On the other hand, they gave us a lot of resources to go pursue the things we were interested in and build up those technical skills that we wanted to pursue. Um, can you identify anything in academia that is particularly relevant to the future development of the field? If you had a billion dollars to invest in research, what would you want to see people build? That's an amazing question. Um, I'm going to give you one answer. And if I had another hour, we could probably come up with like 15 more. Um, but one thing that I think is profoundly interesting is better identity proofing and better identity management. Right now, I think you can trace back a lot of our security challenges to the fundamental inability to know who the person on the other end of the keyboard is. And I think the election that we just went through is a perfect example of this. There was a lot of talk as we are in the middle of a pandemic about the right way to do an election. And as of 2020 in American society, we have not reached the point that we feel we can have confidence in our election by doing it remotely. It would have been safer from a public health perspective for everyone who has an internet connection, to be clear, and not everyone does, but for everyone who has an internet connection, which is many of us, to stay home and vote over the internet. But as we said earlier, anytime you take a system and you plug it into the internet, you plug an ethernet cord into it, you're exposing it to a whole lot more risk than it's exposed to as a self-contained voting machine that's just plugged into an electrical outlet that's sitting in the middle of a voting center with a poll worker watching it, right? And so we've decided in 2020, with all of the amazing, profound, incredible achievements in technology, that we need to keep our uh, voting machines Mm, air gapped is probably too strong a word, but um, disconnected because we, we cannot have confidence in our election today without having um, voting machines that are disconnected that produce a paper trail. If we were able to invest in identity management and ways to identity proof and then have confidence in people, whether that's an individual um, ID card that has kind of cryptographic protocols on it that you use every time you engage in a government transaction or some idea that, that we haven't even thought of yet. That would be, I think, a, a sea change in our ability. If we can have trust in who that person is and know with a high degree of confidence who they are, then that enables us to kind of turn on a bunch of remote transactions that we can't do or at least can't do well right now. Um, great. The other 14 ideas for me some other time. Let me let me actually um, kind of close off with this as, as I'm making my final points is um, I am probably not as technically savvy as many of you in this room. Like I said, I am not, um, I'm not a network engineer. I've never been a network engineer. Um, senior management in cybersecurity is interesting to me, but I probably don't have the pedigree to be a good chief information security officer. So much of my work has been in policy and thinking about the systems and thinking about the, the controls and thinking about how the federal government affects the choices that agencies make and, and by extension, the choices that people interacting with federal systems make. So much of that kind of has been from a policy perspective that I have not developed a lot of those technical skills that I suspect many of you have. So um, what I'm interested in always is the big conversations and informing the big conversations uh, with the technical knowledge that I don't have. So I would invite you to reach out to me. I'll give you my, um, I'll give you my personal Gmail address. Uh, I'll put it in the chat in just a second. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, feel free to connect with me by email. And if we can set up some time to have a, have a follow-up conversation about this, or if there were questions you ask that I didn't fully answer or questions that come up, 
to you after this. Uh, more than happy to, to continue that and would love to hear your thoughts um, on kind of where you think the uh, where you think the federal government should go under a Biden administration in terms of federal cybersecurity. <laughs> Other than that, um, just thank you all for engaging in the conversation, for being interested in this topic, um, and for being interested in cybersecurity. The, the stat that I like to, to leave people with is we have over 200,000 vacant cybersecurity jobs in the United States today, and many of those jobs are with the federal government. So if you're interested in pursuing a cybersecurity career, I don't think that anyone at this point should necessarily pick a single employer and have that be the only career path you're looking at. But I certainly hope that you will consider the federal government as one place to come and hone your skills um, to support the important missions that we have going on there. And as is even more obvious today and over the past few days, um, we really, really need the cybersecurity expertise. So thank you all for having me come and speak to you this evening. Doc, thank you so much. And I got to say, being that I'm not technical myself, this has probably been one the one the most interesting ones that, that I've attended so far. And I think it's a really good example of the different career paths that we can take. I don't think we, we, we do a lot to expose folk to, you know, the different avenues that you can take in inf information. Security. So, thanks again, everyone. Uh, we, this is recorded. I'm going to stop it now and um, Tell, tell people about it and certainly hopefully they'll come back and um, listen to it again. So again, thanks everybody for attending. Have a wonderful holiday and uh, we'll see you hopefully on January 19th. Bye-bye.